Okay, uh, good morning everyone and thanks to the organizers and the program committee for inviting me. It's a, it's a pleasure and honor to, to be here and, and also congratulations to, to John and all of ACME on the, on the new EDM bound. So I want to talk about uh, quite a different topic. Uh, it's about our efforts to, to try to understand very strongly interacting uh, Bose gases, uh, in particular the so-called unitary Bose gas where the scattering length is infinite and so the interactions are as strong as theoretically allowed by the, by the laws of quantum mechanics. As many of you will know, the unitary Fermi gas is something that many people have been studying for you know, almost, uh, well, more than 15 years now, actually. And it's still fun, it's still not uh, fully understood, uh, but uh, unitary Bose gas is something we really barely are beginning to, to understand in the, in the last uh, few years. So to put this into, into a, a broader uh, context, uh, generally, you can characterize uh, Bose gas by three length scales, the scattering length A, which we can tune with the Feshbach resonance, uh, the thermal uh, wavelength lambda, and the distance between particles D, which is set by the, by the density of the gas. And so from these three, using these three length scales, you can construct this kind of crude uh, phase diagram of a, of a 3D bulk uh, Bose gas. So you construct two dimensionless ratios. D over lambda is essentially the, the temperature, and D over A is the inverse interaction strength. And so this large area over here is trivial. This is a weakly interacting uh, classical uh, thermal Bose gas. Then uh, over here is your typical rubidium 87 uh, BC, which is D over A of about 100. And this is fully described by uh, mean field physics and, and school. But you know, we've been studying this for, for 20 years, and, and we understand basically everything. Then over here at D over A of about 10 is where you start to see beyond mean field uh, quantum correlations. And we are also working on that. And some of that is on our, on our posters. But this is, uh, this is generally stuff that is, that is accountable for by well-established theories developed back in the 40s, 50s, 60s by Bogolyubov and Li Huang Yang and, and so forth. This is basically where the corrections to mean field of the order of few percent, so they are experimentally observable, but the theories still work, or you can just sort of start to see how they break. Now, what we're really interested in ultimately is to understand uh, this uh, bottom left corner here, uh, where things are very hard and where there's very serious shortage of both theory and experiment. It's hard for a number of reasons. First, it's hard because of strong interactions and, and strong correlations. But additionally, it's hard experimentally and, and theoretically because unlike the unitary Fermi gas, which is protected by the Pauli exclusion principle, in the, in the unitary Bose gas, we also have severe three-body recombination and losses and heating. And, uh, and so this uh, makes the system intrinsically non-equilibrium. And then additionally, because it's lossy, we don't have much time to do the experiments, so we don't go to this regime adiabatically. We actually quench A suddenly to, to infinity, so we make it kind of doubly uh, non-equilibrium. And then finally, over here is sort of our strange normal state, like you also have in a unitary Fermi gas or cuprates. So if the interactions are strong enough, then even the, even the normal state is actually not trivial, and sometimes you do experiments there because they're a little bit easier. There is an equilibrium state well-defined, and it gives us some hints about what's going on at unitarity. Okay, so these are our experimental tools. Uh, we work with potassium-39, uh, which has this nice uh, broad uh, Feshbach resonance that's entered at 400 Gauss, uh, which we use to, to tune the, the interaction strength. And in most of our experiments, we no longer use the, the traditional uh, harmonic trap, uh, but this uh, optical box trap, uh, which has the uh, advantage that the gas density is uniform uh, inside this box, and that makes it much easier to, to interpret our experiments and compare things with theory, especially when you're studying some nonlinear effects. Okay, <laughs> then these are the people who actually uh, did the work. Uh, those in red uh, are here and they're, and they're presenting uh, posters. As in particular, uh, Rob uh, Smith has been kind of my, my main uh, collaborator uh, for about uh, 10 years until uh, very recently when he abandoned us for another school. Um, and then this, uh, these people on the left uh, are those uh, postdocs and students who have worked on the, on the specific experiments I will, I will focus on today. Uh, in particular, uh, Rich Fletcher and, and Chris Eigen uh, led uh, those measurements, and we have also collaborated, uh, have still collaborating with Vera Cornell and, uh, and Martin Zwirlein. And some of the, the work by other people is, is on the posters. Okay, so <clears throat> there are two sort of halves, two, two aspects, two sides of the coin uh, to, to my story today. Uh, so the first one is how in this, in this unitary uh, Bose gas, everything is elegant and, and universal in some way that will become, hopefully become clear. It basically means that you can make everything, everything depends just on the density of the gas and you can make all quantities dimensionless and then those dimensionless results uh, are universal. And then the second half of the talk is how that is actually not true. 
and, uh, and how this breakdown of universality might actually be what is actually more uh, interesting in the, in the long run once you really understand it properly. So for those of you who already know a little bit or, or, or a lot about this topic, uh, basically one has universal uh, preconceptions and expectations. Uh, if one pretends that this strongly correlated unitary soup consists only of atoms with two body contact interactions. And this is an approximation, but this assumption turns out to work quite well for, for most uh, experimental observables. And then the, there are also signatures that we haven't covered of the non-universal things, and these non-universal things are related to three-body FMO physics. All right, so let's start looking at the experiments. So we go down here in this, in this bottom uh, left uh, corner. And as I said, we generally have three land scales, but now two of them are gone. Lambda is gone because we've gone to zero temperature, so lambda has gone to infinity. And the scantering length is gone because we've gone to Feshbach resonance, so A is also gone uh, to infinity. So both of these have dropped out of the problem, and we're left with only one land scale, uh, D, which is equal to density to the minus one third. And so this is where this idea you know, of uh, the so-called universality hypothesis comes from. That we have this state, which is in principle arbitrarily complicated. We don't know uh, much about it. We don't really understand it. But if it has only one length scale, uh, then you can construct only one momentum scale, only one energy scale, only one time scale. And in analogy with the, with the Fermi gases, even though these are bosons, uh, these are called Fermi momentum, energy, and time. Okay. In some sense, when, when the interactions are tuned to infinity, these bosons get uh, somewhat fermionized. And so the idea is that, you know, that this, this one length scale physics uh, leads to some kind of new simplicity. You know? and, and basically it means whatever you can think of, you can express uniquely uh, in, these, uh, in these scales, and then it becomes just a dimensionless number, and that dimensionless number should be universal. Now, as I hinted before, uh, the problem with the, with the unitary uh, Bose gas is it has strong uh, losses in heating, and actually, additionally, the problem is that these universality scaling arguments also apply to the losses, okay? And that's a bit scary, at least before we do the experiments, because basically, for all we know, without experimental results, what we expect is some kind of state which has energy per particle of the order of Fermi energy and also has the lifetime of the order of Fermi time, which is just the same thing, okay? And, and so if you like, you know, what we're looking for is some kind of state which has a quality factor of order one. And so a big question is like whether this state even exists in the sense that, you know, where it is well-defined in some, in some equilibrium uh, sense. Now, of course, we don't know the prefactors without experiments, so this Q could be 0.1, which would be a disaster, or it could be 10, which would be brilliant, but we just don't know. Now, to get going experimentally, there's also a silver lining to this problem, which is that if you know, the losses actually show some signs of universal physics, then you can just study losses, and those are relatively, you know, they're comparatively simple uh, experiments you know, to, to perform and, and analyze, right? So you can get going that way. So this is the, the basic experiment. Uh, you start here, this is one over A, and, uh, and this is the time. So you start with a weakly interacting gas in a box, then you suddenly quench A to, to infinity, and in this, in this cartoon, you know, the, the particles swell up as much as they can I, you know, to their interparticle distance. That limits the strength of the interactions. Then you wait there a little bit, and then you turn off the interactions and do a measurement and see what's left. And what you see as a function of time is that the particle number decays, but also the gas heats. These are time of flight uh, pictures. And so the first result that we wanted to, to confirm, and, and other groups also in the field, uh, is the so-called universality hypothesis as seen in the, in the loss dynamics. And for, for a box-trapped gas, the prediction is very simple, is that n dot over n, where n is the particle number, is simply minus n to two-thirds. Okay, this is this fermionic two-thirds. And because we work in a box, you can simply count particles. If this was an inhomogeneous gas, then this becomes much more complicated because it's a nonlinear equation that you have to average over the density. But this is just for the degenerate gas, okay? Anyways, so we do the experiment, so we just count the atoms. It's a simple idea. We count the atoms as a function of time, and you'll be taking up statistics so we can differentiate our curves, and then we plot n dot versus n on a log-log plot. And what you see here is actually two regimes. So the first one is the one that, that we already could easily anticipate. So at large particle number, which means short times in the evolution after the quench, uh, we nicely see this fermionic gamma equals two-thirds. Uh, but then this stops holding at some point, essentially because the gas has heated up. But it still looks as a power law, as you can see here. And uh, actually, it's a power law that you can also analytically predict. Okay, so this is another universal number, gamma equals 26 over 9. Okay. Uh, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not a number you see a lot in physics, uh, but it was derived at a call normal, so it should be true. So what we see here is, uh, is basically a crossover from a degenerate to thermal gas. And it happens in this example when the atom number drops to about 40% of its initial value. So we have lost about 60% uh, of the particles. 
It turns out this is not just in this example. It turns out that this crossover also has many uh, universal features. So it's actually, it doesn't matter what atom number or what density you start with, the crossover always happens when you lose about 60% of the atoms. It's actually 57 plus minus four. And the reason this number is universal, I don't know why it is exactly 60%, that's the sort of number for the, for the theorists to, to think about, uh, but the reason this is universal is because basically, you know, the losses and the heating are not two independent processes, okay? And so the only reason the energy per particle grows is because of the loss, so everything is coupled, and so maybe more intuitively what happens is that the crossover always happens when the kinetic energy per particle grows to some universal value, okay? And that universal value turns out to be 1.7 Fermi energies, according to our first estimates. So again, these are sort of numbers for, these are you know, just dimensionless numbers, which are for theorists to think about. But the number we care most about at this point as experimentalists is the time, is the crossover time when the transition happens after the quenched unitarity. And again, completely independently of what density you start with, that always happens at four Fermi times. And so this kind of makes us reasonably happy. I mean, four is much better than one. This is suggesting that maybe we have some kind of many body state that actually has a quality factor of four and not one. So we have more hope to keep going and maybe observe some quasi or quasi equilibrium uh, properties of this system. So I, I'm gonna reiterate this because it's a key point. So basically like, you know, to, to, to rephrase my, my big question from the beginning of the talk, uh, now the big question is whether four is much larger than one in this, maybe some people have a feeling. Is four much larger than one? Sure, okay, thank you, Bill. <laughs> so, so whether four is much larger than one in this context, I think Lando said it at three, you know, so four is more conservative than that. So basically, like, you know, this guy, this, the generator gas lives for four Fermi times, and the question is whether that is enough for it to, to establish some kind of uh, equilibrium or quasi-equilibrium uh, steady state properties. And if so, uh, can we look just at early times when only coherent stuff happens, and the heating has not taken over yet, and can we separate the coherent dynamics from the heating, and ultimately, most ambitiously, even though we cannot turn off heating yet, there are some ideas about that, you know, could we actually deduce experimentally what the state of the gas would be if there was no heat? So this turns out to be uh, pretty hard. If you tried many things that didn't work, I'm gonna show you just one example of something that does not work easily. It's an important quantity, but does not answer these questions. So if you simply look at the total energy uh, per particle and its evolution in time on a logarithmic time scale, you start with some low energy, you end up thermal, this part is theoretically understood, and, but from there to there, you go in a very, very smooth fashion right here. So we cannot separate this into two numbers. We don't see any kind of plateau, any kind of intermediate you know, stop gap, uh, and we cannot say like this much is correlation energy and the rest is heating, which is what we would, what we would like to do. So this didn't work, and there's various other things like condensed fraction, momentum distribution that don't work. But we have actually uh, found a way to make progress. Actually, our, our student, uh, Chris Eigen, uh, has experimentally uh, made this discovery, found a way to, to go forward. And so the idea is um, what we do here is we do fully momentum and time uh, resolved uh, analysis of, of, the, of our dynamics. So we start with the BC, everything is K equals zero. You quench the unitarity, and so that's not an equilibrium state. Even if there was no heating, that's not an equilibrium state. And even if there was no heating, the momentum distribution would broaden and the higher K states would get occupied just because the correlations are developing in the system is becoming some strongly correlated state. The question is like, you know, whether that coherent correlation growth can be separated from the, from the heating at long times. And it turns out that if you look at K states independently, it can. Okay, so again, this is logarithmic uh, time axis. And individual case states, you do see these kind of plateaus, right, where first you have fast rise, and then eventually heating kicks in. But in, the, in between, there's some kind of saturation. And these time scales where this happens are over the order of Fermi time, so that makes sense, and also, again, one is much less than four. But you also see that these lines are not perfectly aligned in time, which is why this information is lost if you simply add up all the curves and, and look at the total energy, so you shouldn't do that. So what we do instead is we study two things. We study this momentum-dependent relaxation time, if you like, how long it gets, takes to get to this uh, intermediate steady state, and what is this steady state momentum distribution, and then we piece together uh, this n bar k of k function, uh, which is not a momentum distribution at any specific time, this is a subtle point, but it is our best experimental guess of what the momentum distribution would be if the heating never kicked in in the system. All right. And so these are the results uh, for this relaxation time towards the steady state and the steady state momentum distribution. Uh, I'm not gonna uh, go into all the details of this, but just to stress some salient points. So the first order message is again, that this is very universal, okay? So everything here is dimensionless, and I'm showing data for, for three different densities, 
But if you express all times in Fermi time, all momenta in Fermi momenta, and so forth, so that everything is dimensionless versus dimensionless, then all the data collapses onto these universal curves. Whatever these curves are, again, is a theoretical challenge. As a, as a sort of next uh, layer of sophistication, we can make some more comments, and one is that uh, the, the relaxation times make actually some sense. It has been, uh, to some extent, even semi-quantitatively anticipated by the theorist, and uh, the basic, what you see here is basically that uh, it's one over, relaxation time is one over k uh, in dimensionless units at low momenta and one over k squared uh, at high momenta, and, and this we can qualitatively at least uh, understand uh, as, as being related to the phasing of, of excitations, which is sort of Bogolyubov-like, except in the unitary gas, the speed of sound goes to the Fermi velocity. Right? So the chemical potential is of the order of Fermi energy, the speed of sound is of the order of, of Fermi velocity. So this matches the expectation for so-called pre-thermal uh, steady state. Now, on the right-hand side, the result is somehow even more striking. I mean, it's, it's clear that all this collapses onto the same curve. It's a very smooth curve, but it's not a curve that anyone has predicted. It looks perfectly exponential over about three orders of magnitude in, in occupation numbers. So this is a, a challenge for the theory. But if you take this distribution at face value, we can make some estimates of the correlation energy and so forth. And most importantly, the main qualitative message is we can make the estimate of the condensed fraction in the steady state, which is 20%. It doesn't matter if it's exactly 20%, but what is the qualitative message is not 0%. Okay, so I'm gonna switch gears. Everything so far looked nice and universal, but really it shouldn't be, okay? Not everything should be universal. And it shouldn't be universal because of this guy, uh, Vitaly Efimov, who, as uh, some of you probably know, uh, or maybe many of you know, uh, was, uh, was a nuclear physicist, and, uh, or is still a nuclear physicist, and, and back in uh, 1970, he made this uh, prediction that close to a Feshbach resonance, you have this Borromean three-body bound states, which are depicted by these uh, circles here, rings here, and uh, what this means is that you have three particles that are bound together, but if you remove any one of them, the other two separate as well. Okay, so there's no two-body bound state, but there is a three-body bound state. This was predicted in 1970. It was first seen in cold atoms in Innsbruck 12 years ago. It was studied, this FMO physics was studied a lot since then with great success. But all of these studies have focused on various modifications to the loss processes. Okay, those were the experimental signatures. Now, in this sort of new era of, uh, of strongly interactive Bose gases, what we would like to figure out is whether they are, or experimentally observed, you know, the coherent effects of this three-body physics on the many-body behavior, and ultimately maybe even make a gas of this uh, FMO trimers. So from a many-body perspective, in, in light of my uh, discussion at the beginning of the talk, the key point is that the size of this trimer introduces a new land scale, okay? And so that's what breaks the universality, uh, even at unitarity. So now you can take different points of view depending on your favorite theoretical framework. But for example, you know, if you like working in model Hamiltonians with contact interactions, uh, then the existence of this land scale forces you to, if you want to describe this system, not to have just the two-body contact interactions, but to add three-body contact interactions. That's one way to capture the physics. More generally, you could say that in this system, what you expect is some three-body correlations which cannot be deduced from arbitrary complete knowledge of two-body correlations. And these irreducible three-body uh, correlations are, are quantitatively measured a thermodynamic quantity called the three-body contact. Okay. So, so this three-body contact should enter all kinds of thermodynamic relations in addition to the better known two-body contact, C2. I'll give you just one example, which is probably the most famous in the field. If you, if you look at the, the momentum distribution of the gas at, at high momenta, then the famous two-body results, which goes, has been studied from Bogolyubov in the old days to you know, in the modern day, it's, uh, it's, used, it's attributed to Tan. Um, the, the two-body result is that this momentum distribution goes as uh, C2 over, over K to the, to the four, and then if you have three-body physics as well, you should have another term which is one over K to the five. And there has been some you know, uh, weak evidence of this in an earlier experiment uh, by our friends at, at Jilla, but it was not conclusive, and you know, without going into details, you can imagine that experimentally this is horrible. I mean, you know, it's hard enough to see one uh, power law clearly in experimental data, let alone two power laws uh, in the same uh, overlapping region of, of momentum uh, range, in momentum states. And so our first big question, uh, as we foray into this, this uh, coherent three-body physics, is whether there is some other quantity, any quantity, uh, which we can measure where we can clearly uh, isolate the, the three-body physics. And the answer turns out to be yes. Uh, it's, a, it's an interferometric measurement, very atomic physics. Uh, this was figured out by, by Rich Fletcher back when he was uh, my student. So to give you the background, uh, through some dumb luck, uh, in potassium-39, uh, we have these two spin states, red and blue, where red is our usual uh, state that I talk about. But near the Feshbach resonance for red-red, both blue-blue and red-blue are essentially completely non-interacting. 
And so this is very nice for, for many body interferometry. The basic idea is that if you take your gas and you put it, every atom into superposition of red and blue, then the red part of this superposition starts accumulating some complicated phase because of all the complicated strong interactions and correlations between the red halves. Meanwhile, the blue guys are not doing anything, which is great for interferometry because they provide you with the phase reference. And so the key quantity here is the rate of this phase winding phi dot, which we call omega. It's basically a clock shift. And, uh, and it depends, in principle, both C2 and C3. Now, the reason this is a good measurement, you can see only if you calculate, actually, what, what omega is, which Rich did uh, with some help from Eric Bratton. And so omega has uh, the two-body contribution, which is proportional to density, just like the usual clock shift that we all know about. And then it has a three-body contribution, which is proportional to density squared. And this one, if you look more carefully at these functions, this one is very weak away from resonance, away from unitarity. On the other hand, at unitarity, the exact opposite happens. This one is not so small, and this one exactly vanishes because it has this diverging A here in the denominator. Okay, so this is the experiment. It's a basic Ramsey protocol, uh, and we did this actually with a thermal gas because this was easier and it was good enough for this purpose. So it's just two pi over two pulses, and you look at the phase that accumulates between these pi over two pulses, which you deduce from some Ramsey fringes. And the first thing you check, actually this was also a new result back then, but it's not our main story, is, is you go to very low density, so you know there's no three-body physics, it doesn't matter how strong the interactions are, and you tune the interaction strength, and you see that you can recover the two-body theory without any free parameters. The two-body theory is, in, is here in red. And one part of that confirmation is that it's exactly on resonance, where A is infinite, omega is zero, as expected. And so with that confirmed, then you just zoom in on resonance and start cranking up the density, and so the, the, the smoking gun for this, uh, this three-body coherent effect is that the clock shift actually scales as density squared. There's some more details in the paper, but the scaling is the, is the main point. Now, one thing I want to stress as I enter the last part of my talk is that these three-body correlations or effective three-body interactions, they exist because of the existence of the FM of three-body states. But seeing three-body coherent effects does not mean you have actually populated this uh, FM of trimer states. So this doesn't prove any population of FM of trimer states. That brings me to the last part of the talk, which is about molecules uh, in a degenerate gas. So this is... So, so this is, a, again, some of the story is, is some of the methods are very old. The basic idea is that if you are at resonance, at unitarity, and then you don't suddenly jump to weak interactions, but you slowly sweep away to weak interactions, you can convert some of your population, of atomic population, into molecules. And how many you convert is, depends on the correlations at unitarity, some measure of the correlations at unitarity. In equilibrium, this might be just the phase space density because there's, not, not, there's no other parameter, but out of equilibrium, things can be more complicated. And so this is the generic measurement you see here for one particular density. This is time in logarithmic, logarithmic time from microseconds to milliseconds, and, uh, and here we quench to, to, to unitarity. And blue is the full atom population, and the red is the reduced atom population because you have swept away slowly. So in between is the molecules. And so what, what you see here is the generic pattern that initially the gas is not correlated because it takes time for correlations to develop, and now we're looking at really single microseconds. And then it becomes maximally correlated and then not correlated again, here just because it became a thermal gas. Okay, so again, we are interested uh, in early times while the gas is degenerate, so we go on a linear time scale, T hold over T and not, and we look at different densities, but again, express everything in a, in a scaled form. And there's two messages here. The main message is that we do seem to have some uh, steady state between, say, one and a half or two and, and four Fermi times. This is when the, when the crossover thermal gas happens. The secondary, so that's good. Uh, I mean, here the gas is decaying, but somehow it seems to be able to self-adjust. It remains equally correlated while it's decaying. The secondary message is that even though you have scaled everything out, the, the maximum conversion efficiency does not seem to be universal. Okay, so not all densities are made equal uh, as for the purposes of this measurement. And this is some uh, sign of FMO physics because FMO physics has the scale and could separate the, the density. So basically we suspect some of these guys are trimers. But this is not a proof of it. A much better proof came at the same time uh, from, the, from the, our, our experiments at Jilla, I mean, their experiments really, um, where, where basically they could prove that some of these molecules are FM of trimers by carefully analyzing the, the decay dynamics of this molecular cloud away from resonance. I don't go into, into all the details. I have a minute. Okay, great. Okay, and so with that, uh, I'm going to, to conclude just by sort of summarizing the salient points of what we understand so far, which is a bunch of universal things, a bunch of non-universal things. And these are still, uh, to some extent, disjoint you know, pieces of a puzzle, but this, you know, Puzzles, pieces of the puzzle are, are growing and, and starting to join, and it's all looking uh, kind of promising for even bigger, uh, even cooler things to come. 
So just to summarize, you know, this, this unitary soup lives long enough, not just in a practical sense that we can do some measurement, but in a more fundamental sense that it does attain some steady state. And uh, the steady state is quite correlated as judged by the molecular conversion, which is cool. At the same time, it still has a non-zero condensed fraction, which is also cool. And what might make it particularly unique is that it's a, it's a degenerate uh, many-body state, which, which has significant, significantly controlled uh, by three-body physics, right? And I don't know of any other example of that in, in nature, right? Yeah, so thank you. Uh, with that, I'm going to, and then thank you for your attention. Thank you.